Coming up on the DMT One to One Show, episode 67, on the 23rd of July 2014, an interview with Jen Miller, Chief Operating Officer at licensing technology company AudioSocket. Hello everyone and welcome to the DMT One to One Show and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Jen Miller, the founder and uh, COO of AudioSocket. So hi Jen and thanks for joining me, how's it going? Good, how are you? Great, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, I want to start by uh, giving our listeners an overview of AudioSocket's work. Uh, of course, uh, uh, some of our listeners might be already uh, aware of what you guys do, but uh, uh, just to get a sense of what the company is all about, uh, uh, what is AudioSocket in, in maybe 20 seconds? <laughs> wow, 20 seconds. Uh, AudioSocket began as a music licensing company representing emerging artists, sort of those... Uh, bands that everybody's seeing at their more local venues yeah. uh, that needed opportunity to make money on their work. And then we started developing technologies to really streamline that process as digital content became you know, exponentially greater. So now we've developed two technologies, Mass, which is music as a service, yeah. which just streamlines the process of music licensing for digital content, and License ID, which is a brand new technology that we've innovated to track, monitor, and protect copyrights. Awesome. And so uh, tell me a little bit about how the company got started. So uh, you started out at a time where uh, there were a lot less companies working in this space, I think uh, it's fair to say. And so how did it all start, uh, especially in San Francisco, that is maybe not as known as being a music city as, as other places? So we actually started the company in Seattle and in New Orleans. Right. Uh, my business partner, Brent McCrossan, is from New Orleans. And he was working with artists on the side of representation, I was actually looking for artists to place into some extreme sports films. I was doing that as a hobby, uh, kind of making a, a life transition, as it were. And Brent and I met. And literally, sort of the story over margaritas is exactly how Audio Socket began. Uh, we just found that there's tons of I amazing artists that would love to find new ways to monetize their work. And there's a real need for that these days. And so we brought sort of our two angles together and started pre-clearing albums that I would go then to different creators and ask them if they wanted to, you know, have access to all of these different bands. Yeah. They would pay a price and then we would just split the revenue 50-50 with the artists. So we'd go secure the work and they'd bring the, uh, the creative to the table. Yeah. And so uh, th that was one of the things actually that really uh, uh, attracted me to the company a, f a few years ago was the fact that you I have bands uh, on your or on your roster, you know, on, on, on the site that are actually actively touring bands that have uh, maybe, you know, only two, three, four thousand uh, likes on Facebook, uh, but that, that have great quality music and they're actually touring, they're making a living out of the music. And, and so that's kind of the core focus of the company, right? It is. Yeah, we've taken a different approach from a production music library yeah. in that that's typically work that's paid for hire. So they might have, you know, a number of musicians that they pay outright for the work and then they own those rights. What we do is we look for bands that are, again, looking for new ways to monetize their work and get exposure. And we work with them. They maintain 100% ownership over their work. And I, I, we feel like we give them a great alternative to selling their work, yeah. uh, which I know most bands are not willing to do so. But I think there's a real need for that kind of music in you know, content, uh, specifically as content has become more sophisticated. And so, you know, I, I think there's a number of companies now in that space, but Audio Socket, in terms of its original formation, yeah, it's it was definitely one of the first. It was, I think, uh, Pump Audio, and then we were the second one in the game. Yeah. And so let's talk about music as a service. Of course, uh, in the transition from being a company that just had essentially a bunch of bands and a bunch of music uh, to being a company that actually has a, a technological, technologically advanced product, uh, how, how did you manage that and what was your sort of minimum vi viable product when you uh, turned into a technology company, essentially? So what we discovered is that in, in the TV space, it was very saturated. Um, I don't think it's any secret that it's kind of a race to the bottom. Rates have really plummeted. Um, it's really hard to make a living in that space anymore. And there were much larger companies very successful in that space. So we sort of cut our losses, um, realized that we weren't necessarily going to be a big player in film and TV. And so we looked over into the digital space where 
there was at that point 40 hours of content every minute published online. Now there's over 100 hours every minute published online. And we started to carve out a niche. And really, we've developed it alongside that growing vertical. Um, There's been tons of digital creative agencies that have popped up. I mean, we've done work for, you know, our, our, our artists have been used in everything from Gap to Jimmy Choo to, um, you know, Volvo, uh, Geico, I mean, you name it, all the, all these major brands are really leveraging their social media channels to put out interesting content. And that's really where we, I say, I think thrive. And there was a need to, again, streamline that process. And that's where Mass was born. Um, Initially, we launched Mass, Mass with Vimeo. Uh, one of the l- world's largest user-generated content sites. And Vimeo wanted a place for their filmmakers to be able to go and legally license music that they were using in their films. And so our first partnership for Mass was Vimeo. And then after we launched Mass API, yeah. we discovered that a lot of digital communities needed access to this content but didn't have the same tech bandwidth that Vimeo did to build on the API. So we built Mass Storefront, which it literally takes about two minutes to set up a storefront for a digital company or a mobile company that needs music in there, you know, for people to create with. Sure. Sure, absolutely, and, and you know it's it's interesting actually to see to see that uh, evolution of the company, and uh, of course uh, that goes uh, side by side with uh, also the funding that you raise, because the company has raised some, some significant funding to date uh, uh, to develop the product. And so, uh, can, can you t- t- sort of walk me through that journey? Because of course uh, uh, we are we're seeing a lot of funding going into companies that are, are producing services that are not necessarily related to content in, in the way that you are. And so, how did you go about raising the the, the money, and what were the problems or the issues that uh, perhaps the VCs and, and, and people that were, you were hoping uh, would invest in the company were raising with you? So we've actually not raised that much to date. Um, we, I, I would say for a six-year-old company, we've been relatively bootstrapped. Right. Uh, we've raised about $3 million, a little over $3 million, uh, all from angels. And right. we received a ton of support from the angel community in Seattle and the angel community in New Orleans. Um, basically... You know, the funding allowed us to innovate in the tech space. The catalog piece is actually profitable, and it has been for a number of years. But in order to keep up with the space that we were trying to innovate in, we did need to raise those funds. Um, The expectations, since it's not VCs, uh, we have a lot of passionate enthusiasts. Um, They love music. They really loved this company. They loved what it was all about in giving these independent artists the opportunity to further monetize their work. They saw the potential in the digital community. And so I guess I would say uh, it's a blessing that that we've been somewhat left to create this company and the culture the way that I think, you know, me and my co-founder originally had wanted to. Yeah. And we've, we've actually uh, created kind of an urban family within our culture. That's awesome. And so let's delve deeper into the uh, licensing side of things. So um, you offer, I, th- I believe uh, you have nine licenses listed on the site as a, you know, the different types of licenses that people can uh, get content under uh, in different capacities. So how do you develop these different uh, tiers and price points? Is it a question of experience? Did you, uh, you know, sit down and work out all these licenses beforehand or, or do they sort of develop organically as people were asking for different types of, u- of usage of the music? So there's really two things there. Um, With digital content, there is so much content that is truly user-generated content or, you know, videos of people's weddings. Um, So I would call that sort of limited commercial content. Yeah. You know, we can't have sales reps pick up picking up phone calls for two dollar licenses. No, of course. So what we did is we took what is sort of the lower end business and we automated that process so now anybody that wants to license a song for a personal home video or for a film festival or a wedding video we go basically all the way up to medium business right uses so corporate presentation it might be something for their viral channel if they're not a big brand those are all automated, so you never have to actually pick up a phone and go through a couple-day process or, or even, for that matter, a couple-hour process. It's instant. Then where the uses really become more significant and there's actually professional budgets involved, 
that's when you pick up the phone and you negotiate a rate. Um, it's fair when there are budgets involved. You know, you want the artist to be rewarded. And again, yeah. this isn't music that that is owned outright. This these are bands that are trying to make a living. They're out there touring, um, and we're we're trying to contribute to that revenue stream for them. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, it's it's an interesting approach, and uh, uh, definitely one that seems to work. I, I wanted to ask you uh, what your thoughts were. Of course. Uh, the bands that are with Audio Socket, I would imagine for the majority, um, for the most part, would be with a, co- a collecting society uh, of, of some sort, uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, ASCAP, BMI or, or CZAC. Uh, yeah. And uh, But there are companies out there that are actually asking uh, the writers not to be as affiliated with the society. And, and uh, does that raise concerns when it comes to uh, companies that are asking for music uh, as to whether they have to pay uh, those, uh, uh, you know, performance uh, r- 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 societies or not, uh, depending on the music that they, they get? No, very rarely. Uh, it's it's really, at least in the U.S., it's very standard yeah. that, that they should expect to pay the royalties. Um, we very rarely had that be an issue and the caliber of the bands that we're working with i mean what the the thing from the get-go that we've always strived to do is have an extremely curated catalog so yeah. if you go to audiosocket.com and you listen to the artists hopefully every artist whether it's in the genre you like you're going to feel like they're quality yeah. um as opposed to taking the approach of volume which is throw a bunch at them and something might stick We've tried to take the approach of give them, you know, the cream of the crop every single time to build loyalty and to really carve out that interesting niche, which is this band category, again, to, in contrast to sort of the production category, which is is very useful and can be extremely high quality. But bands are culturally relevant and people want to use bands these days in their yeah. content, especially, again, on social channels. I mean, we... I think we get a lot of business from uh, brands that are pretty savvy in creating culturally relevant material. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it feels like uh, brands are really keen on getting involved in, in the grassroots movements of music now you know they've seen the success of red bull and their sort of, of course higher profile initiatives uh, uh, associating themselves with the uh, up and coming bands and i think uh, in that sense uh, the fact that you have so many bands that are on the road and can uh, sort of project that uh, image is pretty precious yeah yeah and uh, so uh, let's talk about the api so um uh, of course, uh, I've covered APIs on the show uh, for, for years now and different types of integration. But I wanted to ask you, so what, what's the role of the API within the AudioSocket ecosystem? Uh, I, I kind of struggle to, f- to find the applications in, in my head uh, for it, but uh, I would love to hear more about it. So the API was truly built for integration into digital and mobile environments. Great. It is straightforward. We've been told that it's relatively easy to use. Um, we have a really exceptional group of engineers working on, you know, continually developing, enhancing that product. And now um, kind of our central focus is license ID, the protective piece. But they have built it with the idea of ease in mind yeah. and low barriers to entry. And so in that sense, uh, we're talking about uh, services, you know, you, you were talking about Vimeo earlier, for example, that would be the kind of service that hooks up to the API and then allows its customers to choose what kind of track they want from the Audio Socket catalog into their video. Is that correct? How it they works? build the ability for their users to search in the ways that they want their users to be able to search. So we we tag music on a, I mean, we, we have over a hundred axis points that the music can be tagged on. Yeah. So Vimeo can then choose which. Uh, subsets they want to make available for searching. Uh, We've also launched uh, Mass with Associated Press. So their clients who are creating content can be licensing their images, their video, and now music uh, using um, the AP's uh, version of Storefront. We've launched this with companies like Monster Energy that just need a ton of music for all the incredible content that they're creating and they have editors around the world. So they want to make sure that they're, you know, sending them to a place where they're going to find really great music that is in line with what they're doing. Um, you know, with their extreme sports, uh, videos. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we've got a lot of different applications of how mass has been used. I think we've got about 10 partnerships. Awesome. 
That's fantastic. And so uh, you mentioned license ID. And so uh, can you uh, walk us through what license ID is in the context of, of audio socket and sort of what the innovative part is of the, of the service? Yeah, so we launched license ID in our own system in December of 2013. So it's been live about eight months. What it does is it gives us the ability to track the downloads that are done from our site. So one of the options when you create an account is you can take a track for a preview, so to speak, which is the standard in the industry. You have to be able to sync it to film to make sure yeah. it fits. Um, all of our downloads as well as our licenses are tagged, and that serves three purposes. The first is when you license your music properly, you get a unique URL, consider it sort of a VeriSign for licenses. You've got a unique URL that you can submit to YouTube or Vimeo or any community for that matter demonstrating your license online. Um, it's a string of text, so it goes into any system at that point. Great. So it's an authentication for people that are properly licensing music. Um, it's a tracking uh, or, or monitoring piece for us where downloads are done and we're often finding that the I's didn't get dotted and the T's didn't get crossed and the music's been used, but it wasn't licensed. And so, you know, on commercial uses, we've actually invoiced, um, I believe at this point, I'd have to confirm with our CFO, but it's about $200,000 over the course of the last eight months where people should have licensed and didn't. Yeah. And we're not penalizing them. We're just charging them what we would charge them if they called us up for a license. So we're not layering yeah. any sort of like penalties on. We're just saying, we found this content. We don't see that you've secured the license. You can click here to do it. And what's encouraging is the last time I heard the stats, over 75% of the people that we were contacting were very apologetic and they were immediately upgrading their license or upgrading to license. Exactly, and, so, and, that's, uh, and that's sort of the model that seems to work. I mean, uh, Getty have been doing that for, with images for a long time. They don't actually penalize people, uh, as far as I know, uh, for using yeah. images, but they email them and ask them to pay for the license. So Right, right. And people seem to be willing to do that, which is uh, encouraging. And then the third constituency, um, the first being licensees, the people that need to prove they have a license. The second being licensor and our ability to protect the artists that we're representing. Sure. And finally, um, the platforms that are trying to verify that this content coming in has a license because the platforms have been sued time and time again. And so we're hoping that this will actually get integrated right into the platforms. Right now, we're we're giving them, you know, the licensees that URL that they can present. But this can be automated completely to where the platforms could, in fact, reach out, uh, build on the decoder API, yeah. and then they would just know then and there if this content had a license or not. And it seems like a very timely technology to come into place as well. I mean, we've uh, we've seen today, uh, we've discussed on the show today uh, the. Uh, lawsuit between Ultra and Michelle Fan, and this seems to be oh, yeah. uh, a sort of a derivative of the lack of uh, checkpoints when it comes to uh, managed channels on YouTube because you can essentially bypass uh, the content ID system by saying that you have licensed uh, the content properly, even though that might may not necessarily be the case. And so, uh, if that case was to go for the label and YouTube had to implement stricter regulations around uh, licensing and, and proof essentially that the music yeah. you're using in videos is licensed even though you are on a, on a, with an MCN and have a managed uh, channel, th that could really be an interesting uh, step. Yeah, we actually have uh, one MCN, maybe two, that are using our storefront product for their communities. Yeah. So they were having problems where users didn't understand licensing or they didn't know how to clear the music. A lot of times they were losing the revenue on that music or on those videos. Yeah. And so Style Hall uses the storefront and I applaud them because when we first started talking to them, they said, we, you know, we really want to do the right thing here. We want to provide our users the both the um, ability to license, the affordability to license and the knowledge about how to do it and make it simple. And so Style Hall now has a um a licensing store where they gift their users licenses. They um, and then a lot of the users just pay the five dollars or ten dollars or whatever it happens to be for the license. But um, but they also use it as a reward system too. Yeah. 
Yeah. And do you find that uh, given all the information that's out there and the fact that uh, people are actually going on your side actively to choose a band, do you find that they are driven to actually say who the band is or in, in some way the bands end up benefiting uh, for some of, of these users uh, uh, by getting some recognition as well as actually uh, gaining some money through the fees? I the more professional content um, does credit the bands yeah. and and I think that they find that that's actually great because if you look at the threads under YouTube videos you often see people asking who is this where do I find it how do I get it um, I'd like to see more of it even less for audio socket than for the band themselves um, I mean we don't get anything out of sales of albums or you know tracks but the band, this is their livelihood, and again, we, we work with independent artists, and we want to see them, or we believe that they deserve sustainable careers, and this is part of that. So I would encourage digital content creators, whether it be a home movie or, you know, something for a multi-channel network or a digital creative agency, at least down in the descriptor underneath the video, it's great when they can, you know... Uh, indicate who the artist is Absolutely. and then you know as a little a little bit of a plug for us it's great when they do say courtesy of audio socket so people know where to license that content for their own videos absolutely and so uh, let's look at the, inter the international picture as well so uh how do you work internationally do you have a lot of bands that uh, come to you or wanted to license uh, their content uh, uh coming from abroad and also do you have a lot of clients that come in from abroad wanting to uh, wanting to license the music from audio socket you know, it's definitely a growing vertical for us. I don't think we were heavily focused with our marketing efforts abroad until a few months ago. Right. And we started to notice that I think, you know, 20 some percent of our business was coming from one country. And so we started to really uh, start to market into that country and we're expanding that reach into other countries as well. That's great. And, and you know, of course, uh, uh, I think uh, musicians all over the world are trying to find new ways innovative ways to make money from their music and uh, and uh, I think a system like audio sockets is definitely one of those that can attract the attention of bands from from anywhere essentially yeah we do actually represent a lot of international artists right in fact I think uh, we have a lot more international artists than we have international clients right now but uh, yeah we've got incredible music coming from all parts of the country absolutely absolutely and so uh, finally you know we talked about pretty much everything but uh, uh, I wanted to sort of uh, branch out from audio socket and ask you a little bit about uh, sort of what you've been doing on, on the side which was uh, you know you, you mentioned that you were uh, part of some interesting uh, uh, conversations recently uh, you know a roundtable discussion uh, with the US Copyright Office to discuss reform so I wanted to sort of hear your take on uh, the latest uh, uh, around copyright reform uh, proposals in the US and sort of what your take is as a business owner uh, with audio socket what do you think would be you know the, the optimal changes uh, in your viewpoint to, to the current system so I actually um, wrote a piece recently that uh, as a guest editor for Hypebot and it's called uh, reinventing the music industry and it's basically the idea that we need to hit the reset button um, tables have been turned and nothing has been the same since, you know, the digitization of music and just that access. Yeah. And so I had, I had suggested sort of a three pronged approach. It's one that we actually use internally with our sales team. Uh, my co-founder coined it, so to speak. Um, it's called TTC, which is trackability, transparency, and collaboration. And I apply that to copyright. Right. And I do so in this way. The transparency, uh, well, the, first off, the DMCA, uh, the Digital Marin excuse me, Digital Millennium Copyright Act calls on copyright owners to police their own content, but we've seen how flawed that is. Yeah. Not only is it impossible to take it down, keep it down, but additionally, it's impossible for people to know where and how their music is being used. And so our tool, License ID, really seeks to gain critical transparency into the world of, you know, YouTube and Vimeo and, um, you know, even things like Hulu, where we can truly report to copyright owners where their music is being used and then put the onus on the copyright owner to take action versus, you know, putting all of the onus on the digital platforms. I, I yeah. really understand and see and feel for both sides of that argument it's almost impossible with 100 hours of content published on your site every day to 
you know, police it. But likewise, they're monetizing works that in many cases they don't have rights to monetize. So um, I, I truly take this very neutral approach where I say we need to work together so that we can give the copyright owners both the transparency to know where their work is being used, as well as the ability to police it the way they want. Right now, it's yeah. just, you know, take it down or uh, monetize it uh, or track it. But for them to be able to do what we're doing with License ID and send a notice to that person that downloaded the track saying, hey, my music is worth something. I'd like for you to pay for it. That's a nice option that isn't there right now. If you monetize your videos, for example, on YouTube, they run ads, but you never know who's using it. And if they're, you know, if it's a huge brand using it, making a ton of money from that, yeah. or if it's somebody's home video, you you just don't know. So transparency is a big is a big deal. We need to create better systems that give us that visibility, trackability, um, the ability for artists to be able to track, and that's again, you know, what we're working on here with License ID is the ability for artists to. Um, put into the audio file in the same way that you lay a vocal track or a yeah. drum track, we are laying uh, a license or information to track that that specific download into the audio signal so it can't be lost through transcoding or voiceover. Yeah. And so that's the trackability. And finally, collaboration. And that's where I think all the parties need to come together and really... Uh, come together with an attitude of collaboration and not defense offense, which I think a lot of times it's boiled down to. Yeah. And I, at the round table sessions, um, I think they did a really great job of bringing a lot of varied interests to the table. They hosted these, um, all over the U S uh, they did a nice job with topics and moderation. Yeah. And I think some, I, there was a lot more agreement than I would have expected coming from all of these parties, which tells me, Reform is really needed and the time is now. And I think what's blocked that in the past is that the parties weren't necessarily agreeing or directly communicating. I guess it's the same as anything when you look at wars or any sort of disagreement. A lot of times you may not be that far from yeah. um, coming together on an issue, except that you only know your side of the issue, not everybody else's. So yeah. I, I guess applaud the U.S. Copyright Office for taking these steps to really engage all of these parties in these open forums where they can discuss those things, find commonality, and then hopefully that will lead to some reform and better systems yeah. where tools can be developed to to track, to give transparency and empower the copyright owners then, you know, either in a free market or at least in, in sort of a free market, which is sync right now. Yeah to do what they want with their own content. Right now, they don't really have that option. And uh, uh, once again, uh, I would like to point uh, listeners to audiosocket.com and go and check it out. It's a great site and there's also some great music. So uh, even if you don't uh, really work in licensing, I guess you can uh, uh, have a, a good time spending a half hour listening to some great bands on the site. And uh, 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 Jan, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. And thanks so much for listening to the DMT One to One Show. You can find it on uh, digitalmusictrans.com and follow through to the links to the One to One Show. And also tune in to our weekly news show where we discuss the latest news in the digital music industry in a panel with uh, another uh, two or three uh, uh, journalists or uh, digital music experts. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. And until next time. If you enjoyed watching or listening to the show and would like to find more, head on to digitalmusictrans.com.